Let's continue our reading commentary together in the book of Hosea. You have a bookmark there, or you're now accustomed to finding it. Hosea, this before the book of Joel in the Old Testament. And we'll be reading from chapter 7. Notice the metaphors as we read down through this. You have an oven. You have bread, you have a dove, and you have a faulty boat. It's like the parables that our Lord told. There's, these are told for that those that are without my hearing them, reading them, hear and not see. But as the Lord gives us eyes to see and we ponder these, and that's why they're given for thoughtfulness. Scriptures are not to be read with haste, but prayerfully, and asking the Lord by Spirit to teach us. So here in chapter 7, we begin with this declaration of the Lord. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. Again, we see Israel. And we see Ephraim, those are synonymous with the ten tribes of the north that followed Solomon's servant into idolatry in Samaria. And the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without. So it's describing here that with all of their determination to continue their false worship. They continue to be robbed of any blessing that the Lord would give on a particular people because the only blessing he does give is in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So pursue and follow after, it's like Christ said, all that came before him were thieves and robbers. It's talking about when it says the thief cometh in and the troop of robbers spoileth without. It's talking about they're even the leaders, because it says cometh in, the leaders within that nation of Israel were the thieves and the robbers and continually drawing the way into idolatry. You say, well, why do people follow such men? Well, verse 2, they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Think about it that only in the Lord Jesus Christ has sin been put away for those that are the Lord's. But for all others, that wickedness is ever before the Lord. They try to cover it, they try to hide it, they try to turn over a new leaf, so to speak, always working on getting better, and yet the Lord says, I remember all their wickedness. All of our righteousnesses are nothing but filthy rags. You can't cover the wickedness of this heart from a holy God. Only in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not simply covered, it's been put away. But outside of Christ, in their idolatrous worship, that sin is ever before the Lord. And so he says, now their own doings have beset them about, they are before my face. What does the Lord have to do to harden a sinner's heart? Just leave him to himself. His own doings condemn him. And unless God grants his grace by his spirit to turn the heart to Christ, man by his sin will continue to do those things that are an offense to a holy God, even their best so-called works. Now, they make the king glad with their wickedness. It's talking there about these wicked leaders. And we're studying about it in 2 Kings, where one after another was raised up, and they continued in the practices of idolatry that began with Jeroboam, the first to go astray after Solomon had passed away, and the princes with their lies. They make the king glad. Think of preachers today, people making them glad, even though those preachers aren't preaching Christ. 
but they draw people after themselves. And these preachers like the fact that they're honored by those that follow them. But here's what the Lord says, and here's the first metaphor here. They are all adulterers. You can't just blame the people, the preachers, the priests, the kings, those over them are all adulterers. Think about the adultery here is to go after another lover. And here's the example. As an oven heated by the baker who ceaseth from raising after he hath kneaded the dough until it be leavened. Now this goes back to the old days of the old ovens where a baker long before he put the bread in would start the oven heating. I watched this in my years in Africa. The bakers would light the fire the night before and get it to where the fire would get so hot it would smolder. And then the baker would make the dough and the bread and let it sit overnight. And then when it was time in the morning, they would come back and they would start fanning that oven and get it to the temperature where it would then bake the bread. But what it's saying here is that the oven heated by the baker is a picture. The oven here is a picture of the heart and the fire. The, the lust that burn, the baker here being one that is about ready to feed the people. So he stokes the fire in order to make the bread to feed the people. But as we're going to read on here and see in verse 6, but we'll read verse 5. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with bottles of wine. He stretched out his hands with scorners, for they have made ready their heart like an oven. Whilst they lie in wait, their baker sleepeth all the night. In the morning, it burneth as a flaming fire. So it's describing this baker here, and I believe the baker represents these leaders that have stoked the fire of people's lust. And while they sleep, this fire in the morning becomes such a flame that when the bread is put in, it burns it. And I think about men's lust with regard to even Christ, who is the bread of life. Their lust is like this fire, and the oven is described as their heart, that when the bread is put in, it devours, it destroys that bread. And that's why when we preach the gospel of Christ, unless God has turned the heart of a sinner to the Lord Jesus Christ to receive Christ as the bread of life, anything in this heart is going to devour any thought of who he is. And so here, verse 7, it says, they are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. There is none among them that calleth unto me. So everything about this fire, and this bread is devoured. It serves no lasting purpose because that's what happens when God gives people over to their own reprobate minds. There is none among them that call upon me. They go about their daily doings, making their bread, and living their lives, but the pride of the heart. Here it says in verse 8, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. So here again is a picture of what men do with the message of Christ and who he is and why he came, what he accomplished. Left to themselves, there's nothing but compromise because only the Spirit of God can turn the heart and prepare it to receive that which God has purposed in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see that word mixed, men prefer, rather than the true bread of life, men prefer a mixed, compromised bread. 
and here it's described as a cake not turned, actually it means half baked. When it's put in the oven, it comes out, one side is burnt and the other is uncooked altogether. And that's a pretty apt description of what people do with the gospel. They pervert it. They add their works to it and they fix it however they feel palatable. And yet in the end, it's nothing but a half turned pancake, basically, on one side, uncooked on the other. Inedible particularly before the Lord. So the Lord's not honored by such a bread, such a mixture. It's not the bread of life. The baker here that bakes it and causes the dough, he kneads in the dough and, and the, the leaven until it be leavened. That's a, that's a picture of the leaven of, and the perversion of the gospel by men. They, they heat their fire and it's, it's baked according to the lusts of the heart. Again, that, that fire there represents the, the lusts of the heart of men. They, like Paul described to Timothy, people going about to heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, not desirous of, of the truth. And so, as he says there in verse nine, strangers have devoured his strength. And he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. So look at all this metaphor here that really describes the, these metaphors that describe the, the pride and stubbornness of the heart. Where strangers have devoured his strength. This is talking about what Paul declared to beware of those that enter in among you and would turn you away from the gospel, turn you away from Christ. They're subtle, they've entered in privily, Paul says, and yet they're not to be received. And yet, it's like the story of the camel, got his nose in the tent first, and then his neck, and then his body, and pretty soon you're outside and the camel's on the inside. That's how they devour, they enter in. But those that are ignorant, or blind because of their deceitful heart. Jeremiah said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? What it's showing is just how easily we would be deceived by another message or a mixed message or a false message, all the same. Here it describes these being burned and ruined and yet not knowing it. Try going around to some of these congregations that really think that God's blessing. And yet Christ is not preached. And long ago, strangers have entered in and perverted the gospel. And people follow along like animals to the slaughter without even perceiving that what they think is the gospel is, is nothing but ruin. Strength is devoured here and it says they don't know it. And aging, when it says he knoweth it not, yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. People like to talk about their longevity, how long they've been attending such and such a congregation. And that aging process, what they consider to be a blessing described here as gray hairs is really a weakening. They're fit for nothing but the fire of God's condemnation, lest God be pleased to deliver them. And then verse 10, the pride. So everything these metaphors describe, it's the pride, it's the stubbornness, it's the depravity of the heart. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. The Lord saying, there's no need to call any other witnesses other than these here because their very pride testifies to their face. And again, Israel, here would be these nations of the north that followed after Jeroboam. It's just to show that this decline and decay, as men age, it only gets worse, not get better. Nothing about this flesh gets better. And ultimately, if the Lord leaves people, their own pride will testify against them like those in 
Matthew 7, it said, Lord, Lord, have we not? Talk about assurance of salvation. They were sure of heaven as their own name, as people say. And yet the Lord said, depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So we've got these metaphors here of the oven, the bread, half-baked, all a picture of man's lusts and depravity. And then the third one here is silly like a dove. Here it says, they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all this. In verse 10, in spite of the clear testimony of the gospel, even Hosea preaching in that day condemned them for their ways. And yet for that, they would not turn. Man won't. And so here's the third metaphor. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. It's talking about a dove that flits from one place to another, one branch to another, unaware of the danger that surrounds the dove. We used to go dove hunting when I was a kid. Every Saturday, we'd go out and see how many we could shoot and then bring back and heat them up and eat them. It tasted great. But when you got close, they'd fly off. But what would they do? They'd land somewhere and then they'd start cooling like a dove. So you could follow them wherever. They had a sense of security and safety when in reality there was danger because we were hunting them. And that's how the Lord describes these, not as using guns necessarily to shoot them. They didn't have those back in the day. But like a silly dove without heart, without a converted heart, they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. So think of that dove calling out. And who are they calling? They're not calling on the Lord. They're calling these enemies of the Lord. They're seeking alliances with Egypt that the Lord brought them out of. And silly like a dove unaware of the danger, they're actually going to Assyria, which is the very nation that God was raising up that would come in a sh few short years. Because at the time that Hosea was writing here, there were but another 20, 30 years before the Lord would destroy this entire nation and take them into captivity. And yet it was to these that they were running, thinking they would have protection against other enemies. And that's why the Lord says, when they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. This is God's sovereignty, using wicked nations to chastise his people of Israel because they were no better, using those nations against the nation of Israel. And he says, I will bring them down as the fowls of the heaven. The spray of the net was the cast of a net, whereby these silly doves then would get caught in them and be brought down. He says, I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. And yet for all that, even though they look to Egypt, they look to Assyria, ultimately Assyria began to come down and take some of the best of that nation into captivity. That's how they did it. But the Lord says, woe unto them, for they have fled from me. That's what idolatry is. It's a turning from the Lord to put confidence in the arm of the flesh. But he says, destruction unto them. This is a God that this generation doesn't know. Everybody's talking about how God is love. God wouldn't hurt a flea. Yet it's pretty clear in Scripture. He has those that he's purposed to save, a remnant. Hosea is an example. But he also is a God of judgment. Destruction unto them because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. When he's talking about having redeemed them, he's talking about having brought them out of Egypt as an example of redemption. There's none that perish for whom Christ has paid the debt. But in the type here with uh, those sacrifices of the Old Testament that were purposed to show God's redemption of sinners, they turned their noses up at it. 
And that's what people do today. They don't have a need of Christ. They don't see their need. They've never been taught that they're sinners. So they go about their way. And they have not cried unto me with their heart. This is the depravity of the heart. That no sinner will actually cry unto the Lord unless the Lord is pleased to open their heart and reveal Christ in them. So they've not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. In other words, here's God now bringing his judgment, his chastising. They howled on their beds because of the chastisement, but not because of their sin. It's like today they have a, what they call the fire escape assurance plan. If you just repeat after me and say, I'm a sinner, and that uh, if I confess my sin, then God will forgive me my sin. So, Lord, I'm confessing my sin. Really, the whole purpose, and people say, you'll be delivered from hell. It's a, a fire insurance plan that people are being taught, but it's false. When they howled upon their beds, they assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebelled against me. What was their interest? Corn and wine. Prosperity. We see it in our day. People gathering together for these prayer sessions and asking God to turn things around and let's ask him to start blessing again and open the heavens to us. It's all material and temporal. Crying unto the Lord as if he's a little Iowa God himself. That's not God. He said, though I have bound and strengthened their arms, yet do they imagine mischief against me. That's all that a sinner can do when God strengthens them and blesses them with temporal blessings. They don't give God the glory. They give glory to their fasting. They give glory to their praying. They give glory to their works. They think that that's why God's blessing them. All the while, it's God strengthening them. Yet do they imagine mischief against me. Mischief against God is mischief against his son. They don't want to Christ that receives all the glory. Man wants to share that glory. And he says they return. That's just a temporal crying unto the Lord because they want him to bless them with what they want. But it says here, not to the most high. And here's the fourth metaphor that we see here, like a treacherous bow. They're like a deceitful bow. This is a bow that's warped. I don't know if you've ever done any bow hunting, but if that bow is in the least bit warped, when you go to aim at a target, you're going to miss when you let go. And that's descriptive of them in their best state are like a bent bow, a warped bow. Whatever they aim at, they continue to miss, transgress. They fall short of the glory of God. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. And this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt where God would take them into captivity. There is that false turning to the Lord that we see so much in religion today. Following the guidance of the, the preachers that if you'll just say this prayer after me, and if you'll just make these reforms in your life and you'll just start making amends and you cry, you wail, you wail your head off while you're on your beds. But sinners they are, and sinners still. They saw remedies, but not from the most high. That's the difference. We own ourselves to be sinners. And when the Lord causes us to see our sinfulness, not just this sin and that, by his grace, he opens our hearts that we look unto Christ alone as that mediator. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how sobering and a reminder that had you purposed to leave us to ourselves, we would know the same end. But it's written here, your promises in scripture are for the edification of your people, so are the warnings. That we not be like those that have a pretense of righteousness and a pretense of seeking after you, and yet nothing but a half-baked cake. 
and of no value before you, the Holy God. Thank God that it's the Lord Jesus Christ in coming that is the bread of life, and he endured the oven of your wrath. And uh, that because of that, those for whom he paid that debt, the chastisement of our peace falling upon him, whereby his stripes were healed. What a blessed and glorious hope there is for those that are yours. So I pray that our eyes might be on your blessed son, whom you've purposed to glorify in all things. Pray for your blessing as we continue to look into your word. We give you the honor and the praise and the glory in Christ's precious name. Amen.